सहना सहनौ भुनक्त सह वीकवाह तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तुम विद्वेशावह ओ शातिशाति ओ पूर्णमद पूर्णमेद पूर्णात् पूर्णमुदच्यते पूर्णस्य पूर्णमाद य पूर्णमेवशिष्य ओ शाति 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 श्रुतिस्मृतिपुराणा आलय करुणाल नमा भगवत्द शंकर लोकशंक शंकर शंकराचार्य केशव बादरायण सूत्रभाष्यकृत वंदे तपन पुनः ईश्वरो गुरुरात्मे मूर्ति भेद विभागिने व्योमद्यादेहाय दक्षिणामूर्त नम What we are going to study is the Chandogya Upanishad. In a typical elaborate uh, Vedic ceremony, there are four priests representing the four Vedas: <coughs> the Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Sa Veda, and the Atharva Veda. The priest of the Rigveda is called the Hota. The priest of Yajurveda is called Advaryu. The priest of Samaveda is called Udgata, and the priest of the Atharvaveda is called Brahma. <coughs> Each one has specified duties. For example, Hota, the priest of Rigveda, he invokes the deities. The priest of the Samaveda sings the praise in the deity. The priest of the Yajurveda makes offerings, reciting. You know, when the mantras are recited, the offerings are made by the Advaryu, the priest of Yajurveda. And Brahma, who represents Atharvaveda, is supposed to know all the Vedas, and he is the overall supervisor. who guides everybody while this elaborate ritual is going on <coughs> so this priest of samaveda sings most of the mantras of samaveda come from rigveda and those mantras of rigveda are set to tune and this they are sung in eh, with five notes or seven notes so there we is called udgata the one who gata udgata one who waters one who sings <coughs> and there was the priest of samaveda sings the veda sings the rigveda so chandamsi gayade di chandogah 
दोनों सिंग्स छंदस और दिवेदा इस कॉल छंदोगा इन छंदोगा नाम उपनिषद दो उपनिषद बिलोंग्स टू द सिंगर्स ऑफ छंदस इस कॉल दी दिवेदा इस कॉल छंदोगिया सो इस उपनिषद इस कॉल छंदोगिया और दी ब्रांच ऑफ दिवेदा इस आल्सो कॉल छंदोगिया दी छंदोगिया उपनिषद बिलोंग्स टू दी सामवेदा नेचरली बिकॉज़ दे आर द सिंगर्स ऑफ द मंत्रास एंड the Samaveda has several, some four recensions are available at the moment. Samaveda is supposed to have 1,000 recensions at some point in time, of which four are available. And we have two Upanishads from Samaveda. One is the Kyano Upanishad, other is the Chandogya Upanishad. <coughs> so Chandogya Upanishad belongs to the Kauthuma recension, Kauthuma Shaka. And the Jaiminiya Shaka, that is where the, the Kyano Upanishad belongs, just for general information. <coughs> the Chandogya Upanishad has eight chapters, and the Upanishad forms the last eight chapters of a Brahmana, because Upanishad is also called Vedanta, the text which also obtains at the end of the Veda. <coughs> so this is the brief introduction about what Chandogya Upanishad? It's an Upanishad, number one, of course. And Upanishad, as you know, is called Vedanta. Vedana Mantaha Vedanta. So that which obtains at the end of the Veda, at the end of Brahmana generally, is called Vedanta. So you can say that the Vedas can be broadly grouped into four categories, the Samhita, the Brahmana, the Aranyaka, and the Upanishad. You can divide the Veda into these four texts or the four parts. First is called Samhita, consists of various mantras, various hymns in praise of number of devatas. There is a primary subject matter of the Samhita portion. <coughs> Second is called Brahmana. So Brahmana also comes from the word Brahma, which means Veda. So really that Samhita portion, the portion dealing with the mantras is called Brahma or Veda. And Brahmana is an exposition of that Veda. So the Brahmana part shows us where the various mantras of the Samhita are to be employed. So Brahmana portion prescribes many rituals and also many what we call the daily Nitya, Naimitika Karmas, the duties to perform daily and on, on occasions. And in performance of all those rituals, the mantra will be involved in some way or the other. The Vedic Sanskriti was such that you remember Ishvara while doing anything and everything. So while cutting a branch of a tree for bringing the fuel for the, for the ritual, you also chant the mantra, Ichetva, etc. For milking the cow, the other mantra, for doing everything, there is a mantra which you recite. And that sanctifies every action that you perform. And Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, when you perform all the actions in such a manner that they become an offering to me. So this Vedic culture was all centered around devatas, the deities who are all expressions of Ishvara. When Ishvara performing variety of roles is called Devata or a deity. And so there are a number of Devatas, Vedic Devatas, Vedic deities, Indra, Varuna, Mitra, Aryan. <coughs> and there are hymns addressed to all these various deities. 
and while performing those rituals, you invoke one of the other deities seeking their grace. Typically, a fire ritual is a way of propitiating Ishvara or propitiating different devatas. And how do we propitiate them? By making offerings. So these days we propitiate, let's say, Lord Shiva in our temple by making offerings that are very dear to Lord Shiva. So Lord Shiva is very fond of Abhishek, of ba being bathed. And so the bathing ritual is very elaborate when you perform the worship of Lord Shiva. You bathe him in a variety of materials, up to 11 different materials, while reciting the mantras. Lord Vishnu, on the other hand, is very fond of ornamentation. So if you go to a Vaishnava temple, the most time is taken in offering ornaments, decorating the Lord. The bath also is done, it's not a very elaborate ritual. But ornamenting, decorating him, adoring, adorning him is the most elaborate ritual. Because Lord Vishnu is fond of ornaments. So Abhishekha Priyo, Abhishekha Priya Shiva, Alankara Priyo Vishnu, Namaskara Priyo Bhanu. So Surya is, Surya means sun, very fond of Namaskara. So, Surya Namaskara. People do salu sun salutations. Up to as many as 162 salutations they perform. Very fond of salutation. Meaning that different devatas are fond of different things. It is Ishvara alone in form of those devatas. And therefore, to please those devatas, we offer them what pleases them. The basic rule is that you can invoke the favor of somebody by doing something that pleases that person. That's general rule, you know. Every salesman does it, every marketing person does it. By offering what you like. If you like the, uh, the cell phone, they will offer you. Every six months they come with different models and give you different apps and different, uh, you know, uh, features. Like motor cars, they will come with new varieties. So how they please the devatas that we are? By different objects of entertainment. And that's a, we also please the devatas by making offerings that please them. <coughs> And so every devata has his or her own personality, therefore the likes are different and therefore the rituals, the materials you offer are all different for different devatas. And while doing that, you recite mantras, which occur in the Samhita section or the first section. So as far as the Mimamsakas are concerned, the only use of the mantras is that they are used in rituals, that's all they are concerned about. When we study the mantra, we are really flabbergasted and, you know, inspired, you know, the way the, the, the hymns are, 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 you know, uttered. But as far as Mimamsa Gaza are concerned, the most important section of Veda for them is the Karmakanda, is a section dealing with rituals. That is the main part of Veda for them. And therefore, all others are subservient to this. Even the Samhita section, where there are all the hymns and the mantras in praise of devatas, all of them have relevance only if you find their application in one or the other ritual. If you don't, this is not a pramanam. So, you find a mantra because pramanam, if it is used, you know, Amna is to kriyartha tvat. Anarthakyam atadarthanam. If there are any mantras <coughs> of which the application is not found in karma, anarthakyam, it is not a, you know, it's not a pramanam. So you'll find that all the mantras of the Samhita portion find their application in one of the other rituals. 
accept the Isha Vasya Upanishad. So if you have studied Isha Vasya Upanishad, the discussion begins of the Upanishad on the part of Hashikara Shankaracharya, who establishes that these mantras of Isha Vasya Upanishad are found to have no application in performance of rituals. So there is Mimamsa caste thing that they are useless because there is no use of, in ritual. The Vedantin feels that they are the most useful because they are not part of karma because they in fact deal with Brahma Vidya or self-knowledge. That, that's just by the way. Ishavasya Upanishad among all enjoys the distinction of being part of the Samhita portion of the Veda. Rest of all the Upanishads are found in the Brahmana or the Aranyika sections of the Vedas. There is one Upanishad, namely Ishavasya, is found in the Samhita section of the Vedas. So, for the Vedantin, it's a very important phenomenon. And there are some, like the Arya Samaja, who think that only the mantra portion is the Pramana. Whereas Mimamsakas think that the Karmakanda is Pramanam, for Arya Samaj is a mantra. So for them the Upanishad is a very important Upanishad. Anyway, that is the general information, but then the Samhita, the Brahmana, Brahmana, why so, so called Brahmana? Because Brahma means the Vedas, and they elaborate the mantra, Samhita section of the Veda, therefore they call Brahmana. So it's called Aranyaka comes from the word Aranya, which means forest. And supposed to be uh, describing the processes, prayers, meditations that are generally performed in forest. Not necessarily, but often. You may say that the Brahmana section is meant for a grihastha or a householder because he alone is qualified to perform rituals. The Aranyaka Section is, you can say, primarily suited to the forest dweller, who is called Vanaprastha, or the forest dweller. Vana is same as Aranya, means forest. And then finally comes the Upanishad, which is for the fourth stage of life called Sanyasa. So, for Grihastha, the Brahmana section. For Vanaprastha, the Aranyaka section. And you need to be a sannyasi, theoretically, for studying the Upanishad. <coughs> Meaning that this shows the progress in the spiritual maturity of a person. The whole arrangement of the Vedas, in the arrangement of the life, the stages of life, which are also for the Brahmacharya, the the stage life of the student, the garhasthya, the life of a householder, the vanaprasthya, meaning the life of the forest dweller, and the Upanishad is meant for the sannyasi of the renunciate. Whether you are renunciate in, in, in as far as the lifestyle is concerned, or whether you renunciate as far as the clothes are concerned, is a secondary matter. But primary matter is that each stage represents a certain maturity. You can call it spiritual maturity. Or in Swamiji's word, emotional maturity. Or Puji Swami used to use the expression, emotional maturity. That if you progress in your life, you should become more and more mature. As his body grows in physical age, the mind also should grow in its maturity. What is emotional maturity? Our Puja Swami will simply say, emotional maturity is the capacity to manage your likes and dislikes, meaning freedom from ragad dveshas. As we grow or progress in our life, ideally we should be become free from our raga, progressively free from raga and dvesha. So how does a householder become free from Ragad Vesha Swamiji? Householder has to perform, you know, he has to interact with the world. 
He has to produce, he has to do the business, he has to trade, he has to distribute, lots of things he has to do. So how does a householder become free from Ragadvesha? There was Lord Krishna prescribed what we call the Karma Yoga or performing your duties without the expectation or let's say without identification with the result of the action. Meaning selfless action or nishkama karma. So for a householder, nishkama karma. Meaning karma or your actions, daily and incidental obligatory duties that are supposed to perform are ideally performed without self-centered motive. Selfless actions as best as you can. Easier said than that, but that is the idea that ultimately we grow into a person who becomes a contributor. Meaning the life of household or karma yoga is the process of transforming oneself from being a consumer to a contributor. You heard all these words, I assume, you know, isn't it? Are you familiar with what I'm talking? You are? Okay, good. Right, right. Sometimes the expression in your face should tell me something. If it doesn't tell me anything, then I'm talking to a wall or talking to a person, so I'm not sure about it. And that is why I do ask sometimes, you know. So some people are sthita prajna, you know, and therefore it's, they are great, of course, in their own right. But it you know, creates difficulty for somebody like me who cannot make out, you know. Who does, he's not sensitive enough to penetrate them, you know. So we look for expressions on face. And see whether, you know, so. So this is the kar- Karmakanda, the Brahmana section of the Veda, which is supposed to be, the f- the which are focused upon karma rituals, but which are meant to make a person a karma yogi. Although not according to Mimamsakas. You heard the Mimamsaka? Mimamsaka are the philosophers who believe that the goal of life is moksha, which is swarga, which is heaven. And different heavens are there. Bhuhu, bhuvaha, suvaha, mahaha, janaha, tapaha, satyam. Up to Brahma Loka. So attainment of this heaven is supposed to be the goal of life because that is where the happiness is. As you are, you are not happy. That's what our experience is. Therefore, we have to become happy. How do we become happy? When you have an object of happiness which can give you happiness. So, if you are not happy as you are by yourself, then naturally you are dependent upon something else to make you happy. And of course, there are objects on this world but there are great limitations that we know. So human being always aspires to be in a realm where there can be inexhaustible happiness. And so Mimam Saka say that that's called Swarga. Where is happiness and no unhappiness at all. Swarga loke na bhayam kinchanasti na datratvam na jaraya bibheti Uvetirtva asanaya pipase sukadigo modate svargaloke. Have you heard this mantra? No? Have you studied Kathopanishad? Yes, okay, that's where it is. But I don't expect that you remember it, but anyway. So this is where the adva- Swami has an advantage, that's all, you know. That he can rattle out a few things that you cannot, so that's the advantage that a Swami has. So there, Nachigeta describes, you know, he requests the teacher Yamaraja for imparting him the knowledge of a ritual by performance of which he can attain, or somebody can attain heaven. So he describes heaven in this manner. Swarga loke na bhayam kinchan. That in, in the Swarga loka, the realm of heaven, there is no fear. 
Why there is no fear? Na tatratvam. Hey, death, you are not there. Because that's what causes fear. You are not there in heaven, so there is no fear. But people are not only afraid of death, they don't like old age also. They don't like wrinkles on their face. Na jaraya viveti. The old age, you know, the decapitated, which is another cause of fear, that is also not there. But daily there are pangs of hunger and thirst, not, you know, uve tirtva asanaya pipase. There is no hunger, there is no thirst, no pang, the suffering of hunger and thirst. But there are mental afflictions. Swargati, what is Swarga? Shokati go, then in Swarga, even there are no mental afflictions. That's how heaven is described. So this is moksha, is it not so? Isn't it, doesn't it like sound like moksha? Hmm? She is laughing. Why? This is a description of moksha, is it not so? No? Why? It's all happiness, unmixed with unhap- you know, any kind of pain. What is it? What do you want? Isn't that what you want? It's temporary, but it's, it's wonderful as long as it is there, is it not so? Hmm? So why would you think this is not moksha? In what way is temporary? Let, let alone temporary, you know, right now. The happiness that you get. That's the happiness you get in moksha. Is happiness. Atantika dukkha nivrutti meaning that cessation of all pain. Niritisha sukha avapti attainment of unsurpassable happiness. That's what they promise in heaven, as I just described. So, what else do you want? That's moksha. Is it not so? I said, as long as you are in heaven, you are enjoying moksha, are you not? Hmm? Coma stays? No, no, no. You are very much consciously enjoying them, not coma. You are not in sleep. And why do these Vedantins uh, not satisfied with this? Because even in experience of that, this is an experiencer of happiness, and there is an object of experience, which means that even that happiness also comes from something other than you. When something comes from something other than you, then what happens there? There's always uncertainty, there's dependence, is it not so? The duality, you're still separated from the object of happiness. And that itself is dukkha, for Vedanta, even that itself is dukkha, dukkha means that is the pain. So this is not even though the Mimamsakas may call this happiness unmixed with pain, for a Vedantin, even that duality of experiencer and experience itself is pain. So what do we want? Happiness unmixed with pain. Means what? What kind of happiness? What will your happiness? What is it? Self. Meaning it is free from the duality of experiencer and experience. See, you should answer in the context in which I am asking. Self is a standard answer, of course. But I created a context that that happiness involves duality and we don't we call it is not moksha. So what is moksha? Moksha is happiness that is free from the duality of the experiencer and experienced. Right? So what does it do? When the duality is there, what's the problem? Because there is a limitation. Experiencer is a limited entity because he, he, he excludes experienced, isn't it? The subject, object and experience. Subject is not the object, object is not the subject, they are not the experienced. Each one excludes the other. So each one is limited by the other, is it not so? What is moksha? Freedom from limitation. Even Ishavasya also says, Yasmin Sarvani Bhutani, Atmaiva Bhut Vijayanada. Ishavasya have studied that? Now, okay. So for a wise person, everything became the self, meaning that 
all this re resolved into nothing but the self, or the consciousness. Anyway, that so that is therefore even that happiness that comes the highest kind of happiness that the karma promises also is not enough to free, make us completely free. But anyway, so as far as Mimamsa Gas are concerned, you can you should perform action only with the desire for result, by the way. That's a primary condition. This Vedantin fellows have come and said, it is Shankaracharya who says, the same rituals are performed without expectation of result. So you perform a ritual with expectation of result, then what do you get? You get the result that is promised by the ritual. You perform the same ritual without the expectation of reward, then what happens? What is the result then? You don't get the result. Then what do you get? It's a loss. You did all this thing and got nothing out of it. You get what? Antayakana Shuddhi. See the sailor's book there. You know, they are pretty good, well trained, isn't it? Huh? When you do something without expectation, when you do something simply as a contributor, then result does not come in future. Result comes right away. What's the result? There is an immediate experience of freedom. Because what is bondage? That self-centeredness is the bondage. And when you deliberately perform an action, Without self-centeredness, that is freedom. That is the, the, thus progressively we become free from the self-centeredness. And that's a real impurity. Generally, ragadvesha, the likes and dislikes are called impurities of mind, right? The ragadve attachments and aversions, they are called impurities of mind. But they arise from where? They arise from self-centeredness. It is my self-centeredness that creates in me the attachments and aversions. Therefore, a self-centeredness, I do not submit myself to my impulse of self-centeredness. Then my self-centeredness does not get any nourishment from me. I starve it. You know, what do I do? I don't give it food or nourishment. Then what happens? It starves. It becomes weaker. Isn't it? And ultimately goes. So that is how as Bhashyakar explains even a householder also is a spiritual, can be a spiritual seeker. He becomes a yogi. For a householder there are two choices. Remember what are the two choices? In Kathopanishad, two choices are given. Remember what are they? What are they? Shreyas and prayas. Right. So prayas means life of pleasure. Which of course your choice it is your choice. That you perform whatever you do for the sake of pleasure. We also have a choice of what? Shreyas. So, preyo, mando, yoga, kshema, dhranide. Manda means an immature person. Or a person who does not have the vivek or discrimination, he chooses that prayas or he chooses the life of pleasure. He at the arthad, and that's how he is deprived of the arth purusha or moksha. Whereas, dhiraha, abhi preya shreha vrunide abhi preya saha. The dhira, the intelligent, the wise, the contemplative, the discriminating person chooses shreyas. Meaning the path of the inner maturity, inner purification of the long, the, the eternal happiness. So there are two paths. One is of the temporary happiness. 
other is the eternal happiness so if a householder lives life like this not otherwise when the extent to which a householder lives the life of a contributor to that extent he gets emotional maturity not just by living life we don't become mature living life intelligently we become mature so what is living life intelligently is living as a contributor as a consumer we live impulsively as a contributor we live intelligently deliberately so only when does the mind becomes relatively free from likes and dislikes so then what happens when the mind becomes free from likes and dislikes what happens i'm not here to test you or um, <laughs> to embarrass you just to make you think that's all because you have studied all of this just to put it together you follow so this thing that thing that thing and then everything is okay but it should be all put together is it not so you must connect all the dots so you have the whole picture before you so the purification of mind makes the mind calm cheerful inward looking from an external extorted mind becomes an inward looking mind shamaha damaha what's the third one uparati right uparati means what inward looking mind abiding mind then you become ready for meditation you know, everybody cannot meditate you have choice to to sit for meditation and do everything that's all right Lord Krishna says karmendriya sanyamya ya aste manasa smaran indriyarthan vimudhatma mithya charasa uchchade a person has freedom to restrain the sense organs i can restrain my legs and hands and speech and eyes and ears that i can do that also we can most if we can do but in, suppose we can do that we have a choice of restrain your organs of action and organs of perception that we can restrain close your eyes plug your ears you know hands and legs are all held in their in their place what about the mind we have no control over the mind and the mind will go wherever it wants to go so meditation means the ability to focus the mind towards an object of meditation and retaining that state for a period of time is called meditation that requires a mind that is free from those distraction is it not so free from the pulls of attachment and aversion so that is why the purification of mind meaning a freedom from raga and dvesha attachment and aversion there is a preparation also required for dhyana yoga or for meditation so if you are familiar with the sixth chapter of the gita that chapter is called dhyana yoga you know it, gita gives a different name but we call it dhyana, the yoga of meditation the very first verse of that sixth chapter talks about karma yoga and then lord krishna goes into dhyana yoga or meditation meaning thereby that the preparation of karma yoga is required for a person to perform meditation sanyasast mahabaho dukha maaptam ayogatah the fifth chapter says don't worry if you don't remember the verses just you know but at least you know that these verses are there so <coughs> lord krishna says that sanyasa sanyasa means meditation is very difficult without the preparation by karma yoga so if a householder lives a life of a contributor a prayerful life then he progressively gains the emotional maturity in the form of progressively 
freedom from raga and dvesha, attachment and aversion. He starts enjoying a quieter mind. He discovers an inner satisfaction. So the craving for the pleasure slowly subsides. And by the time he completes his tenure as a householder, he has now obtained a mind which is essentially free from the craving for the pleasure. So now he enjoys an inward looking mind. So comes the next day, Dhyana Yoga. The after the Brahman is the Aranyaka. See, it's easy to go to forest, but it's difficult to live there, you know. Because there's no entertainment there. These days, of course, you go to forest with all your stuff, you know, the backpack, and so you're everything in there, including a laptop and whatnot, but not those days. When Lord Rama went to forest, he didn't have any laptop. He didn't have any apps and nothing, you know. He has no cell phone, no movies, no music. What will you do? Get bored, is it not so? Without any of those kind of things, they are all the you know the crutches that we require. So, what what is meant by emotional maturity or grow growth in life is progressively becoming free from those crutches. You become more and more self-sufficient. Meaning that the happiness that you normally gain from those means of entertainment. When you start gaining that happiness from ourselves, mind needs happiness. Since right now it does not get from within, therefore it needs all these external crutches to become happy, to be entertained. Therefore, we deliberately live a life, what we call intelligent living, or life of karma yoga, where progressively, as the likes and dislikes go, the inner happiness becomes manifest. That is the reward. By performing karma with the desire, you get a reward. By getting the object of happiness, which gives you pleasure from outside. By giving up that selfishness, by becoming a contributor, also you get reward of happiness coming from within yourself. So which is preferable happiness? Coming from an object outside or coming from within yourself? Which is preferable? Where is the freedom? What comes from you is freedom. There is a progress towards freedom also. Understand? Moksha is not one short deal that I got liberated overnight. That doesn't happen. People report that anyway. Something happened, you know, I blissed out. That may be so. I, we don't deny because we don't know what happened to them. And I, we have no problem with anybody. It's all possible. All we can say is that if such an event has happened, it must be culmination of many things they have done in many past births, you know. And so right now some flash happened and something happened. We don't wait for that. There's some flash. I'm waiting for something to happen. <laughs> so some people flash has happened because they were so sad and depressed and about suicidal and something happened. But don't wait for that kind of thing, you know. Because we may commit suicide, that may not happen, you know. So therefore, <laughs> people report all kinds of things that happen to them. It says, do you know, it's better to salute them from a distance. We don't need to, exp to repeat those circumstances, you follow? That's not circumstance, not important. What happens from within cannot come without paying the price or without working for it. Nothing comes free. Nothing comes free. If they promise you moksha in three days and seven days and thirty days and this days and package and stuff like that, nothing comes free. There is no shortcut. You have to grow. Meaning, you have to grow in your inner purity, in your inner maturity, in your inner goodness. You have plenty of it. Infinite thing we have. Puram. You have to tap into our own purity, on our own goodness, our own wholeness. No choice. 
if you, if you skip that and something happens to you, then it is again like Swarga, you know, Kshine Punya Marte Lokam Vishanti. What comes always goes away. If it came without, you know, uh, without your deserving it. In short, Vedanta does not offer, as best I understand Vedanta, okay, it does not offer any shortcuts. It is a process of inner growth which is a, a pure proven path, which is a sure path. It is not a gain of something not gain because then it can go away. It is only gain of what is already gained, so it cannot go away. It's a beautiful process. Puja Swamiji says, if, if Gangotri is beautiful, the journey also is beautiful. Meaning this process, when you progress, you keep discovering your own wholeness. It's a beautiful process. And so, uh, I would not go for any other stuff, you know, where uh, something is done. They put you in some kind of circumstances and create like this. What do these Zen people you know, ask you a question uh, you know, and, and something happens to you? Maybe. What happens? I don't know. Something happens. That business is all, you know, uh, I don't know. As I said, this is a sure path. It may be a long path. Lord Krishna says, Yat Tadagre Vishamya Pariname. This may be the involved exertion. You have to work hard. But it's a rewarding path. But in the beginning, it may be a little bitter or, or you know, difficult. Parinami amrutopamam, but results into what? Amrutam, Im, you know, immortality, into happiness. So Ayurvedic medicine is always bitter. You know that? But that's what removes your disease and results into health. So there is a disease, what they call bhavaroga, or disease of samsara, ignorance. And so some bitter medicine is required. It can, you know, the disease will not go unless we have the right kind of medicine, rasayanam. So thus when a person is prepared by living life of maturity during household, then he becomes prepared for the meditation. That's the aranyaka. So, Vedantins explain that the Karma Yoga is meant for Nitakaran Shuddhi, purification of mind and Dhyana, meditation, or Upasana it is called. It's not just meditation. Again, our meditation is not just in looking at something and, you know, some, some Trataka concentration, looking at flame and some kind of, our meditation is not like that. Nothing, we are not, nothing wrong with those, we are not opposed to it. But our meditation is always of the nature of worship, ish, mental worship of Ishwara. It's called Upasana. So Ishwara must be there. And devotion must be there. That's what bond binds you, you know. It's like a binding factor. So mental worship of Ishwara in one form or the other, so they give you different forms. To begin with, you connect with Ishwara through some link. In the absolute nature, Ishwara is formless, attributeless and there is no connection there. So, that relationship which is free from connection is attained through a connection. You know that volt pole? You know volt pole? When they lift? What is it called? Huh? Is it? Pole wall. Sorry, I'm using the wrong word. Yeah. Pole wall. Meaning you take a pole, lift yourself, and jump, high jump, right? Pole wall. So that pole is required for you to rise to that level. Then you, know, you can jump that barrier which is five feet or six feet. Not from a ground we can't do that. So that pool also is required to lift us up to that point. What do you then do? You drop it, isn't it? Or you take it with you? 
then it brings us also along with it. So time comes when you let it go. So there is time to let go that also. That's called sannyasa. Anyway, but up to that, you require that pole. <coughs> so also that ultimate barrier is the formless, attributeless Ishvara, which is ourselves. But before we are able to do that, we need to tune up with formlessness, through form. Therefore, for upasana, or what we call mental worship, or meditation on Ishvara, the Vedic tradition has been to give us some prop, some alambana, some support, like a pole. Pole is an example. Pole is not for meditation, but just an example. So he used to recommend pole for meditation now. <laughs> Something like that, you know, the equivalent of that. It's called, we'll see, pratika, it's called a symbol of some kind or the other. Like Shivalinga for Lord Shiva. Like a Shaligrama is there for Lord Vishnu. Or something that you like. And we will see here in the Chandogya Upanishad. Some very beautiful way, I mean the patterns they give us. Which are existing patterns in the universe. So we also look at the universe. And they show us the way of how to look at the universe. How to see Ishvara in the universe. Because what is Ishvara? It is Ishvara always manifest as the universe, right? So it should be there. It's there. But then we need somebody to show us that, you know. See, when we were in the children, there used to be a, 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 a sort of picture on the wall. There's all kinds of lines in there. And they say, look at Lord Krishna in there. Or look at a deer, some, some object there, something. I don't see it. Where is Lord Krishna? All I see are confusion of lines, that's all I can see. Then the teacher painting, you know, the art teacher would say, Hey, look at, do you see the eyes here? In that tremendous confusion then, yeah, there are those eyes. Have you seen those three dimensional things that when you keep constant, you concentrate like that and slowly it expands. Oh yeah. I see now Lord Shiva there. I see something behind him also. Oh, I see a temple also. Isn't it? It evolves progressively. That was not there those days. But when we were children, this, this was there. So in this confusion of lines, you don't see anything. Then our teacher says, points out. Hey, do you see the eyes here? They had to focus my attention. You know what is meant by that? What is this? That all those other confusion of line I negate from my mind. You follow? And focus attention, then I get, yeah, I see the eyes. I cannot see the eyes as long as the confusion of lines is there. When that confusion of lines is excluded and my attention is focused on those eyes, I can see the eyes. Then, yeah, now I see the nose of Lord Krishna. I can see the lips, a little smile, and then slowly the features become, you know, evident to us. Meaning that in what at the first sight appears to be total confusion, nevertheless contains that beautiful form. We don't see it at the first sight. So we need somebody to show, draw our attention, show us, isn't it? So we see the universe is all confusion. So we need somebody to show us that in this confusion there is a harmony. In this diversity there is a unity. So the Upanishadic meditations, the Upasana meaning the mental worship of Ishvara, in Chandogya Upanishad and other Upanishads also, is not based on the symbols, things that we know these days.
Because these symbols were not there at that time. These murtis, etc. were not there in the Vedic times. They, well, that's, that, that evolved in course of time. So the Vedic seers were able to perform their meditations on the Anishvara, just based on the universe that is in front of them. So in Chandogya, and also with whatever we are familiar with. So, you study Taitriya Upanishad? No, okay. So there the teacher teaches different kinds of meditations based on what the student is familiar with. So what we are familiar with, that can become the basis. For example, suppose you are reciting, you know, uh, Gayatri Mantra, some mantra. You are familiar with that. So if some meditation is told me or uh, instruction with me based on Gayatri, then we are very familiar. Then I can meditate upon Ishvara based on what I already know. Therefore, the teachers prescribe meditations based on the background of the students, what the students know. So in Taitri Open is Samhita. Samhita means joining the letters. Hmm? A plus E becomes what? A plus E becomes what? A. That's right. Good. And A plus A becomes what? Ah, wow. That's great. <laughs> that is called Sandhi, the conjoining of the letters. With, with the students are very familiar, you know, when they are reti- reciting the Vedas. And somebody will break the... So when the teacher teaches us, it's a long sentence. And it's to break the sentence. When you break the sentence, he breaks the Sandhi also. Then it sounds different from... So a part of the sentence sounds different from the whole sentence because the sandhis are also broken there. Sarvasya chaham rudisanni vishto So the verse is Sarvasya chaham rudisanni vishto But when you break that Sarvasya chaham rudisanni vishtaha sounds different. So that's how the students know the rules of Sandhi, conjoining. So that is a basis. So that is given as a model to meditate. When they are studying from the teacher, the teacher repeats, the, the teacher recites, the students repeat. That's how the Vedas are learned. So they are familiar. So that becomes a, you know also a framework for meditation. So we find in the Upanishads the teachers show meditations on the basis of something that the students are familiar with so that they can start from where they are and then progress will really grow. Similarly, so here Upasana or meditation is based on something that we know for the purpose of discovering something that we should know. You follow? From the known to the unknown. From the the many to the one. From the effect to the cause. That's the progress. From the gross to the subtle. That's the Aranyaka portion. And when they with these meditations then the person becomes now has the focus of the mind. Because Brahma Vidya, knowledge of Brahman requires the highest focus. Why? Because there is no form. Brahman is no form, a self is no form, no attribute. So now we have to contemplate upon something which is without attributes. For that you require a mind which is able to even let go of whatever attributes there are. Therefore all these preparations are required. So if a force comes the Upanishad. So, Samhita, Brahmana, Aranyaka, Upanishad. 
ब्रह्मचर्य गृहस्थ वाणप्रस्थ संन्यास दैट्स हाउ द अरेंजमेंट इज एंड सो उपनिषद आर ऑल्सो कॉल्ड वेदांत बिकॉज ए कम एट द एंड दे कम एट द एंड ऑफ द स्पिरिचुअल प्रोग्रेस ऑल्सो दे कम एट द एंड ऑफ द वेदिक टेक्स्ट ऑल्सो But there is no such rule. I mean, generally we can say the Upanishad is not necessarily at the very end. Sometimes you find it in all sorts of places. So Upanishad and Chandogya Upanishad is one of those Upanishads. How many Upanishads are there? Hmm. Hundred eight. Oh wow! Not ten. I thought there are only ten Upanishads. No. So what is this word ten? Where does it come from? That is because Bhaskara wrote the Bhaskas on these ten Upanishads. When he writes Bhaskas, there must be something there, isn't it? Therefore, they are accepted as the major Upanishads, not necessarily in length in terms of the content. And Chandogya is, of course, one of them, and one of the very long Upanishads also. Longest is Bhudarnika Upanishad. some are shorter than that is the chandogya upanishad so this is what the chandogya is said is part of samaveda in what they call the kauthuma recension in 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 comparison to kena upanishad also a samaveda upanishad of the jaimini recension <coughs> the kena upanishad called mantra upanishad and chandogya upanishad called the brahmana upanishad so we'll show the distinction between them in the next class <coughs> om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnam udachyate purnasya purnamada ya purnameva avashishyate om shante 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 shankaram shankaracharyam केशव बादरायण सूत्रभाष्यकृत वंदे भगवत पुनः पुनः ईश्वरो गुरुरात्मे मूर्ति भेद विभागिने व्योमद्याप्तहाय दक्षिणामूर्त नम ओ शांति श शांति हरि ओ श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओ